Hi everyone, this is part eight of my science practices series for AP Psychology students. In this video, I'll focus on the ethical considerations in psychological research. This video will provide you with the answers to the following questions. Why do psychologists use animals in research studies? And what ethical guidelines safeguard human and animal welfare in research studies? By the end of the video, you should be able to define the concepts listed here. So first, what is ethics? Ethics refers to the moral principles and values. They help us distinguish right and wrong, and ethical principles help us determine fairness, integrity, and respect for others. Ethical guidelines help us maintain trust and accountability. And before conducting a study, researchers must submit their proposal for institutional review. Universities and research organizations have established what are called IRBs, which are institutional review boards, and they are governing bodies that comprise of at least five members. They have to have at least one scientist, one non-scientist, and at least one community representative. And the IRBs screen research proposals to ensure that they are safeguarding the rights, the welfare, and well-being of the participants involved. Both human and animal studies must adhere to different ethical guidelines, and these ensure that the participants, whether human or animals, are being considered, their welfare and their well-being. Some psychologists choose animal participants to understand the basic psychological, behavioral, biological processes, and we can can see these across different species and animals can provide valuable insights into human biology and psychology. Using animals can also allow researchers to conduct an experiment that may not necessarily be ethical or practical with human participants and especially in a very controlled laboratory environment, animals can be a better participant for researchers to study to provide clear and reliable data. Additionally, animals have shorter lifespans, and this allows for researchers to do a quicker observation of life cycles and generational effects, which would take much longer and be more challenging for researchers to do in longitudinal studies with humans. And even though animal participants might be used rather than human participants for ethical reasons, it doesn't mean that researchers have no code of conduct. They they still have to get approval for their study from the ethics committee. They have to abide by animal welfare regulations. They need to use proper housing and care for the animals. They're still going to have training and oversight. And there are three factors that they need to follow in research studies with animals. They're called the three R's, which is replace animals with alternative methods when possible. Uh, reduce the number of animals used and refine the procedures to minimize harm. So next I'll go through the guidelines that safeguard human participants. First is informed consent and informed assent. So researchers must obtain voluntary informed consent from their participants before they participate in the research study. And this ensures that the research participants understand the purpose of the study and if there are any potential risks. They should have enough information about the details of the study to make an informed decision as to whether or not they should participate, and they should be able to withdraw from the study at any time. Informed assent refers to minors who participate in research studies. They, as well as their guardians, should be given enough information to determine whether they should participate, but it would be the guardian's decision whether or not the participant who is a minor joins the study because they are not legally able to make that decision for themselves. So to put this in a real life example, if a researcher conducts a study on the effects of a new drug without fully explaining the possible side effects to the participants, they would be violating this guideline of informed consent. 
it's essential for researchers to take necessary steps in order to avoid causing physical or psychological harm to their participants during the study. So one ethical safeguard that's very important to take into account is to, as much as possible, protect participants from harm. For example, if a researcher was pre-screening individuals for um, potential histories of uh, mental health issues, this could help them exclude participants who might be more vulnerable to distress. They could also decide to provide counseling support throughout the study to protect them from harm. They could implement safety protocols or, if necessary, emergency procedures. They could conduct risk assessments to determine if there are any uh, areas throughout the study that could cause potential harm. They could also monitor the participants throughout the study to monitor their distress. Um, or they could look for ways to find non-invasive methods if possible. But the goal is to protect from harm in as many ways as possible. Next, it's important that researchers avoid deception unless it's necessary. And even then, the deception must not cause any harm to the participants. And it should be disclosed during the debriefing process afterwards. For example, if a researcher tells participants that they're in a memory study, but actually is measuring their reactions to fake emergency scenarios without the participants' knowledge, this would be de deception and it could potentially cause stress and anxiety to the participants. But there are some cases where deception is necessary for study and in these cases, the researcher must adhere to strict ethical guidelines to protect the participants. So an example might be um, researchers must demonstrate that first the deception is necessary for the integrity of the study and that all non-deceptive alternatives are not feasible. So first they have to prove that it's necessary to use the deception and then they should minimize the extent and duration of that or that uh, deception that they're they're deceiving their participants with. Um, they also need to make sure that the deception is not causing significant harm. They need to make sure that afterwards that they are thoroughly debriefing their participants and debriefing as soon as possible. They also need to make sure that their participants have the right to withdraw at any time. And even when specific details are withheld, the participants need to be given as much information as possible. And lastly, sometimes studies that use deception do so through something called research confederates. These are actors that are posing as participants or researchers. And if a study is using confederates, they must abs be very central to the purpose of the study. Otherwise, the researcher should not use confederates. An example where it might be necessary to use confederates would be a study on conformity. If you wanted to see whether the participants would conform to the behaviors of a group, you would need the group to be in on the study and act out the behavior that you were trying to see the participant conforming to. And so therefore you would need people to be Confederates in that study and it would be necessary to the purpose. Next, an ethical safeguard that's important to be included in a research study is debriefing. Researchers must provide participants with a full explanation of the research's purpose and procedures after the participation. So by providing a full explanation of the study's purpose and procedures and any deception if it was used, debriefing can help restore the trust and alleviate any potential distress that was caused by the research. It also allows the participants to understand their own contribution to the study. And debriefing also provides the opportunity for the researcher to address any questions, concerns, concerns that the participants might have. And this just ensures that they leave the study with a clear and accurate understanding of their own involvement. And this continues to uphold these ethical standards of fostering a positive research exper experience. N Next is confidentiality. Researchers must ensure that participants' data is kept conf confidential and used only for purposes outlined in the study. This maintains that um, sensitive data, personal identifying information is not disclosed without the participant's consent. 
So to close, let's do a few short review questions. Remember, as we've done in previous videos, I will read the questions aloud, but you will need to pause the video to determine the answer. The correct answers will be displayed at the end. So question number one says, what must a researcher do to fulfill the ethical principle of informed consent? Question number two says, which ethical principle requires that participants be told about the true purpose of the research at the end of the study? Question number three states, if all four proposals were sent to the Institutional Review Board for approval, which animal study would likely meet all necessary ethical principles? This concludes part eight, ethical considerations in psychological research. You can check the answers to the multiple choice questions below. Make sure you can explain the following questions and define the vocabulary terms here.